Hey everybody, today I am going to be reviewing Knights of Cabiria. This film came out in 1957. It was directed by Federico Fellini. Fellini, of course, is one of the great Italian auteurists of the cinema, and really he needs no introduction because his reputation precedes him. He had a very long, very consistent career where he was constantly evolving and his ambition continued to grow, his creativity continued to flourish. After the war, Fellini was quite young. He was in his 20s and he was involved in making a lot of those early post-war Italian uh, neorealism films, which you know, the majority of them came out in the 1940s. These films reflected a darker world, a more impoverished world, which certainly reflected Europe and how it was likely feeling at the time, post-World War II. These are very simple stories, but they're very emotionally poignant, and they're often about working class characters at the center, and a lot of the time they wouldn't even get real actors to perform these parts, they would actually get people that were working class, who were living in these circumstances. And when you watch early Fellini films, you can see that that influence quite heavily. There is a simplicity and a rawness to those early films, such as Knights of Cabiria or La Strada. But when you watch both films, it's clear that they're not just Italian neorealism films. They, they're clearly dabbling in experimentation and elements of surrealism. Though it's just hinted here and there, you can see kind of the early stages of what Fellini would eventually become in terms of like the staples of his artistic vision. So, you know, you see hints of performance art, maybe like that carnival imagery, which he's known for, a lot of religious imagery. And of course, as he went on, his films got more and more abstract, more avant-garde, I guess you could say, with iconic films such as La Strada and Eight and a Half, Juliet of the Spirits. I could go on and on, but there's something about his earlier work even though I don't find it maybe as dense or as rich as some of his later films that had more ambition, there's something about films like Knights of Kiberia that I constantly find myself returning to. A film that is so stark, so nuanced, and so full of emotion even amidst the simplicity of it. And it has one of the greatest female protagonists of all time, in my opinion. And that would be, of course, Kiberia, played by Giulietta Messina, who was, of course, Fellini's wife and muse. She is just spectacular. She is radiant in every moment and she carries every single scene beat for beat even when she's not speaking, especially when she's not speaking. She feels like a character that that came from the imagination out of fantasy that is maybe too eccentric, too passionate uh, to be understood in this very grim world. I mean she even hums her own theme music. You know she's just, she is color in a black and white world. And I can't stress enough, Messina is so incredible in this film. I felt like she took the idea of the eccentric clown who is kind of a laugh away from a tear, the one that she played in La Strada, that is destroyed by her circumstances, and she kind of built on it and, and created an even stronger character. One that to me is more complex and is less fragile, though, is still painfully uh, alone and very sad as well. But she's just, she's obnoxious as a character. She's crass. Uh, yet she's really strong. Her facial expressions and her mannerisms are very comical, very goofy. She does her makeup in a way that it does feel very kind of cartoony. You know, she does her eyebrows where they have that that permanent sharp frown. And she does, she, she appears kind of a bit like a clown, a bit like a mime artist, or maybe closest to Charlie Chaplin's The Tramp, which of course is an iconic character that is also very poor and also quite animated and comical, but with a lot of pain beneath the exterior. And it's just a reflection of, of performance art, I think, which of course, as I said, is something that Fellini was known for showcasing throughout his career. The idea of this persona we wear to hide our vulnerability from the world and, and from ourselves. But what is so wonderful about Kiberia, and I think why she, she stands the test of time as a character, one of the reasons at least, is because of how very human she is. She is a feisty bitch for sure, but she she also needs love in a world where she has never been accepted and where the luck unfortunately has just been against her. She's so proud of her independence. You know, she's constantly telling people, well, I'm, I'm not a beggar. You know, I'm not homeless. I have my own house and I have running water and I have electricity. And that is her defense mechanism, a way of, of covering her scars, you know, just becoming this very brash character. And I love that no matter what she goes through, 
she remains strong and firm in who she is. When she's in some really fancy, you know, posh part of town with all of these, these elites and these fashionistas, she, she sticks to her guns. She never once gives up her personality, that animated spark. She's never trying to impress them. She doesn't see them as better than her. Though ironically, Kiberia's great flaw is, is her dependence uh, and, and depending so heavily on what she wants, clinging to the idea of what she thinks she's supposed to be or what people tell she's supposed tell her she's supposed to be because of you know society's standards for women um, without ever allowing herself to find the happiness within herself. Her desperation, I think, is part of her Achilles heel as a character. And, you know, if you live long enough in this life, we often discover that things rarely come to us when we want them too badly. Religion is a prominent theme in Fellini films, and certainly in Knights of Kiberia as well. Kiberia looks to this idea of God, you know, of religion to sort of guide her so she can rid herself of all this guilt she feels, because she does want to become a better person. But she expects God to be the one to do it for her, to save her, and as independent independent as she is, as independent as she seems, she's constantly wanting to be saved. But of course, when she goes to visit the church, she, in typical Kabiria fashion, gets drunk and she realizes that, wait, God has granted us no miracles. I'm exactly the same as I was before I walked out of there. And, you know, she sees nuns in, in the distance and she starts taunting them. She's making a complete fool of herself like she often does, and that's her way of lashing out. But I love how when she stops her, her antics, and she hears them singing in the distance in that field. And it's very haunting, very beautiful. And she's, you know, she's taken by it. It's those little moments in this film, th that subtlety that to me, those parts of it are the most human and the most revealing. Another key point in the film that I mentioned earlier is we see Fellini dabbling a bit in the idea of performance, which is also, like I said, a huge, huge part of his work. So Kiberia, later on in the film, she wanders into this magic show and she gets brought up on stage. She gets hypnotized by the magician. And while she's under this hypnosis, she reveals a lot of her, her inner truths to the audience without even realizing it. She reveals that, yes, beneath this exterior, she wants to be happy. She wants to get married. She just really, really wants just one person out there to really love her. Of course, when she snaps out of the hypnosis, she's absolutely horrified because, you know, her emotional vulnerability has been compromised for the amusement of the audience, which is a running theme in her life. But it's a very important scene, the idea of magic and performance. In a way, it actually, well, no, actually, it reminds me a lot of the scene, the Club Silencio scene in Mulholland Drive. A scene that's wanting to convey the idea of what film is naturally, a, a film as a manipulative device, uh, performance being an illusion. And that, that seems to be the, the same idea here. What we perceive to be real isn't real, and so our emotions are naturally going to be manipulated. But also the idea that within performance, within performance art, we're, we're often revealing a lot of our vulnerabilities you know, our, our insecurities, our loneliness. And we're doing all of this within the illusion without knowing. And that's what makes art revealing and, and why it resonates. And that's what we realize about Kiberia. We already knew she was lost, but here we see that she is really lost. She is just, she's just a, a three-dimensional character in, in a two-dimensional world, a product of her environment, yet crippled by those circumstances. Looking for answers in all the wrong places, yet she is courageous in her search for them. And she does, she does have a really good heart, but she does often neglect a lot of the good things in her life, the small moments because she's wanting to be loved so bad. The opening scene, I feel like, encapsulates her so well. And it's just, it's a, a long shot. We don't see her up close until a bit later. And she gets shoved in the river by her lover and he takes her purse and runs away, never to be seen again. A bunch of young boys and a man, they, they come and find her, they drag her out, they, they attempt to revive her, and immediately, you know, she gets up and, and, and she doesn't even care. She just runs off and she's looking for, for her lover. Clearly she's been physically affected by what just happened and they're trying to help her, but you know, she doesn't want any of it. And they're like, hello, you almost drowned and we just helped you, what the hell? And she's just kind of like, yeah, great, okay, you saved me, whatever, gotta go. It just gives you everything you need to know. And even though it's a very sad set of circumstances at the beginning, it's also quite humorous the way it unfolds. And of course, this scene does eventually mirror the, 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 the end of the movie where she is hurt so deeply and she is abandoned yet again, like all the other times, but this one is probably 
the most painful. She's right on the edge of a cliff, literally, and uh, it's one of the most heartbreaking things I've, I've ever seen. It would be so easy for her to jump off that cliff, really, really tempting, uh, and in a way I found myself wanting her to jump, sadly, but she won't, and you know she won't because she's she's a survivor. And I think what's so special about that ending is it is a mix of the most painful and the most triumphant because it is the one time where she does transcend the concept of true happiness and she does find it within herself because it's one of those things where when you hit rock bottom emotionally, that's when you recognize what's important. She finds herself just walking in the woods at night and she comes across a bunch of a bunch of kids that are just playing music in the woods and, and having fun and she has a black tear coming down her face because of her, her makeup and you know again it is kind of the, the sad clown image. The final shot is just it's it's perfect, you know, it emits the tears in her eyes. She looks right into the camera and gives us a little smile. She's breaking the fourth wall yet again in some ways, as if she's very conscious that this is a film that we are watching, but it's just for a moment. Kind of like how she's humming her own theme music, music that is supposed to be non-diegetic becomes diegetic. And it does that throughout the film, sometimes diegetic, sometimes non. The film is just aware of, of the surrealistic elements and it is testing those waters almost through the symbol of Kabiria as a character. That scene at the end, oh my god, it, it makes me cry every single time. It is so real and so pure and there just aren't enough movies that convey that kind of emotion through such simplicity. The film isn't so wrapped up in its, its artifice and in its aesthetic. It has the maturity and the confidence in the character of Kabiria to be able to carry that emotional weight for us. And that score by Nino Rota, there are no words. There are no words for what he was able to achieve in collaboration with Fellini all those years. I hope, I hope that Fellini knows just how lucky he was to have somebody like this uh, interpreting his films. Rota for me might be maybe the greatest film composer who ever lived and many of his best scores are the ones that he did with Fellini and I think this one is right up there with like La Strada and Amar Cord. It's amazing how well he's able to understand uh, you know Fellini's mindset and what he's going for. It's, it's so intuitive and how he understands Kabiria. It's like he's completely translating her in to music. It's very romantic and, and sweeping and, and gorgeous, yet it's it's certainly capturing the humor. It's very cheeky, a lot of wit, but also incorporating kind of a tad bit of that that mysticism, that dreamlike quality into it. I don't know, I'm, I'm always at a loss for words on how to talk about Rhoda. He's just, he's special. Just listen to it. It's better than talking about it. And watch this film. I mean, really, it is, it is truly special. It is Maybe not known in the way that Fellini's great works are known. Of course, La Dolce Vita and Eight and a Half, like I said. And I do admire those films so much. There is more to explore and more to think about for sure, but there will always be a special place in my heart, like I said, for those earlier films and for Giulietta Messina. She just truly, she gives, for me, one of the great performances ever by, by an actress. I love exploring the evolution of a filmmaker and particularly I enjoy the evolution of Fellini and especially seeing it from his early stages, just how he's, with this film, it just feels like he's kind of peeking through little peepholes and kind of exploring like, oh, I really like this. So we're just gonna put a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there. He's trying to set himself apart from the neorealism, yet he, it, it's so focused and well-balanced as a work. So yeah, if you get a chance, please see this film. It is so special and it ages absolutely beautifully. And that is my review. Thank you all for listening. All of my social media information is below. You can watch more videos here and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.